Welcome to the Making Sense Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, very short intro today. Just two things. Reminding supporters of the show to subscribe to the private RSS feed. Please go to my website, log in, preferably on mobile, and go to the subscriber content page where you can push a button for your favorite podcasting app and get the private feed. Then you should be seeing this show appear in your podcatcher with a red Making Sense icon, not a black one. And then you will not miss any content because a few things are changing and I don't want you to fall through the cracks. Sorry for the inconvenience. And finally, with regards to my previous podcast with Andrew McAfee, whose book is More From Less, many of you love that podcast, and I just want to let you know that his book is now available this week, publishing on Tuesday, the 8th of October. And now for today's guest, uh, who also has a book publishing this week. My guest today is Megan Phelps Roper. Megan is an amazing woman. She's been on the podcast before. Her book is Unfollow, a memoir of loving and leaving the Westboro Baptist Church. And Megan is a writer and uh, formerly a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, which she left in 2012. And she's now an educator on topics related to extremism and communication across ideological lines. As you'll hear, she's very well placed to do that. And really, just a, an amazingly resilient and wise and together person. Given her background, that is no small miracle. So, without further delay, I bring you Megan Phelps Roper. I am here with Megan Phelps Roper. Megan, thanks for coming back on the podcast. It's really good to be back. So, uh, you have been really busy. The last time we spoke on the podcast, you just had a Twitter feed, if I'm not mistaken, and now you have a daughter first, and most important, but you also have a book and uh, I think a movie that will be based on the book. You, you've been you've been very busy. Yeah, there's been a lot going on. It's kind of it's kind of funny. For a long time, I felt like everything I was doing was really reactive. You know, somebody was asking me to come speak somewhere or you know talk about. Westboro in my life and everything. And then when it came time to write this book, this was the first thing that I actually had to say, I want to do this. Mm. And then to, to and it, that was a little bit, and I think, I think we talked about that a little bit last time, just that feeling of, you know, not wanting to, ha having spent my entire life telling people how to live, to now say, okay, you guys, now I have it fi all figured out. And hey, let me tell, tell you what the answers are now. Right, right. So it, obviously that's not the tone I take in the book and that's not the tone I take in real life, but it definitely is kind of a, a little bit of a mental hurdle to to get over. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's certainly quite a task to decide to sit down and write a book as well. And and um, yeah, you've written really a, a wonderful one to read. And I, I think our conversation will not do the book justice deliberately. I, I just want people to read it. The book is Unfollow and it's your, your memoir uh, and your account of leaving the Westboro Baptist Church. And uh, on the last podcast, we, we spoke you know, a fair amount about your life and, and what it was like to be in the church. I think we should recapitulate a little bit of that just so people have a, a sense of what's going on here. But you know, then we'll move on to some other topics. And also, I got questions solicited from Twitter, which I want to cover. Sure. I guess well, I think you have to tell people who don't know, and, and that will be some significant percentage of people, I think, just what is the Westboro Baptist Church and how did it start? The Westboro Baptist Church is a group of about 70 to 80 people, and it's made up almost entirely of my extended family, and they have become really well known. In the past, it's been almost 30 years now since they started this picketing ministry. They would go, we would go, starting from the time I was five years old in 1991, and protest. It started with the LGBTQ community and then, and then just expanded from there until it included literally everyone outside of our church. Everyone outside was a legitimate target for our protests. The things that they're probably most well known for are, again, their, their protests of the LGBTQ community and then also 
military funerals, mm. the funerals of AIDS victims and anybody that they considered sinners, which again is literally everyone. <laughs> so and anybody that got any kind of attention was especially was a target. Yeah. So people have seen pictures of kids and, and you were one of those kids holding signs at military funerals and just you know, in, in protest over whatever, basketball games and just in random places. And the signs, the juxtaposition of the kids and the signage is what has been so shocking about this church. I mean, you, the, you know, the, the classic sign is God hates fags. Give me some of the other signs that were most offensive to military families and, and others. Thank God for September 11. Mm. Thank God for dead soldiers. Those, those especially were really offensive to a lot of people. And then there were ones like, pray for more dead soldiers and pray for more dead kids. And those ultimately were, they became a huge problem for me. And I'm, I'm happy to say now that, you know, for, you know, in the, in the time after I left the church, I started, you know, making art, re you know, reaching out to my family and making these arguments to them generally from a scriptural perspective. So even though I am no longer a believer, I, I don't believe in the, you know, the infallibility of the Bible, I still make arguments to my family from the scriptures mm. because I know that that will be what they find most compelling. And so I, I started to say, I'm happy to say that since I left and started making those arguments, they, they no longer hold those signs. And of course, I, I always have to joke that, you know, not praying for people to die is kind of a low bar you know, when it comes to human decency. But for Westboro, it was a huge shift in their position. And so that's, for me, that's a really hopeful sign that just like I was reached, they can still be reached. That's interesting. So I wasn't aware that they had modified their message to that degree because I saw the, the Louis Theroux documentary, the, the, the more recent one, which we'll talk about. So you're saying that they, they still hold the, the homophobic signs, but they don't hold the ones celebrating the deaths of soldiers and children? I think they still have the thank God signs, because for them, that's absolutely still a scriptural, you know, because they believe in predestination. That mm -hmm. is a scriptural proposition that you are supposed to thank God for all of his judgments, because they are, by definition, righteous. So I think this, the thank God signs are still there, but the praying for more dead, praying mm -hmm. for more curses on their enemies, those ones are the ones that have, that are not part of their repertoire anymore. Mm -hmm. So your grandfather started the church, and and what was his background? I mean, how did he how did he get his revelation or his commitment to a um, an unusually doctrinaire version of Christianity? I think he grew up Methodist. It wasn't. It didn't seem like they were particularly or especially religious. But then he graduated high school at sixteen and got a principal appointment to West Point Military Academy. And, but he had to wait until he was 17, you know, in order to, you know, matriculate. And so in that time between when he graduated and, and when he could actually enroll, he got saved at a tent revival meeting in the South. And he thought it was, he thought he needed to become a preacher. And so that's what he did. So for a while, he was a traveling preacher. He went to a, a few different uh, he went to Bob Jones University, which at mm -hmm. that time was in Tennessee, and then also uh, to Prairie Bible Institute in in Canada, and and so he, he started this religious education, and then he, the, he got to Topeka, you know, as a as a traveling preacher, he got to Topeka, Kansas, and he was preaching at this church called Eastside Baptist, and they liked his preaching so much that they asked him to stay in Topeka. And you know, settle down and become the pastor of the Westboro Baptist Church on the other side of town. And but how do you think he became more hardcore than anyone within a thousand miles? What was that path like for him? You know, some of this, of course, is is conjecture. It just seems like he had such confidence in his own thinking. He was extremely intelligent. You know, he graduated high school at the top of his class, and but it just seemed to like over time. And especially once he became the pastor of his own church, it just seems like he, he had such a sense of certainty that the Bible was the literal and infallible word of God and that his understanding of it was necessarily the, the truth, you know, mm. the only righteous view of it. He didn't believe in interpretation, which is, you know, it's a, that's kind of a feature of groups like Westboro. They don't believe in interpretation, even while they are 
necessarily interpreting. You know, they have to figure out how to apply these principles to their lives. And, but yeah, they, they don't believe in it. So, mm. so they just think that just the, the literal understanding as, as from their perspective is the truth and, and the unquestionable truth. So it seems like, you know, with Gramps, it was just that, that sense of certainty that, you know, made him so sure that everyone else was wrong and that everyone needed to bow to his understanding of it. Yeah. And so, and so then he essentially indoctrinated the whole family. I mean, he didn't have a family yet, I suppose. And then he started having many children and many grandchildren, and you all became the church. Right. Yeah. So most of the church, it's, it's about 80%, 80 to 85% is my, is my extended family. And even now, the few outsiders who have joined the church, the very few outsiders, when you, especially when you consider how much attention Westboro has gotten, the few outsiders who have joined, many of them have married into the family as well. So, you know, of this, if you, you saw Louis's most recent documentary, two of my siblings are now engaged to a family that had, you know, a father had joined with four children. Three of those four are now either married or engaged. And I think the oldest is just in their early 20s. Yeah, and there's a crazy story of the, the first documentarian who, who came from the outside world to cover the church wound up joining it. Is he, is he still a member of the church? He is. He's one of the elders, actually. He wasn't right. the first documentarian who came, but oh, no. he, he is the first one who came and stayed. Right, right. He, he really went native. Yeah. Amazing. So, and from my, I mean, from my you know, perspective, it, it, he had this, you know, many of the same features, you know, just psychologically as mm. Gramps. You know, that, that idea of there being one standard, that's a really compelling idea, that there yeah. is one standard that it is a divine and unquestionable standard and that that my judgment has to be followed you know in all things like that's for a lot of people that's that can be really and especially especially people with large egos which i believe is absolutely true of both that documentarian you mentioned and and my grandfather well it's also it is the path to perfect clarity right i mean if you're, mm -hmm. if you're just going to eschew any ambiguity or any burden of of multiple readings, and you're just going to find the most literal one possible in every case. Was that the the algorithm that you guys used as far as rendering interpretations that were not considered interpretations, just be as literal as possible in every case? Basically, I mean mm. that was that was definitely definitely a feature of how we read the Bible. It's kind of funny because I I also feel like you know we we tended to choose the most strict interpretation. So for instance, there was a, an expositor that we would read a lot named John Gill. And, you know, when it came to certain aspects of the New Testament, you know, where in cases like, um, you know, divorce and remarriage, Westboro sees that as always, that is always, you know, forbidden by God, mm -hmm. because Jesus, and you know, in Luke 16 says, if you divorce your wife and marry another, then that's adultery. And if you marry a woman who's been put away from her husband, then that's adultery. So it seems like very clear. But there are other verses that kind of seem to moderate that position. And John Gill, you know, took the more lenient stance. And in that case, we thought John Gill was a heretic. So, mm -hmm. so even the people that we looked to for a lot of guidance, you know, became heretics if they weren't as hardline as we were. And the other interesting fact about your grandfather that became an interesting fact about the whole family is that basically... Everyone became a lawyer, right? Or, or so many of you became lawyers, and, and there's a, a family legal firm that you must have had clients that were not religious maniacs. So how did all that work? <laughs> yeah, no, we, they're, I, I would say most of the clients of Phelps Chartered are, they're not related to us. They don't share any kind of ideology with us. But my family has a reputation of being good at their jobs, not, you know, overcharging. And I feel like it was very similar to the way it was in school. People just kind of generally compartmentalize who mm. we are at work or at school versus who we are on the picket line. And so, yeah, I mean, there were, we had clients that were, you know, part of the LGBT community. So like there was, wow. there was a couple, I remember every time they sent in a payment, they were, it was a, a lesbian couple. They, they wrote on both the check and the envelope with the check. They would put the two female symbols like interlocked. Uh. I just thought that was very funny. Just this, this, you know, yeah, that's going to work. Dichotomy. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Where did the the emphasis on protest come from? I mean, this is not the usual way that people try to spread their 
brand of Christianity or any other faith. How is it that you guys spent so much time with all the kids in tow on the sidewalk with signs? Well, it didn't start with picketing. You know, there was about a two-year period from, you know, because I mentioned, I think, last time, the the incident that sparked the picketing. The, the at park, this, yeah. Yes, at this local yeah. park. And so from the time of that, you know, that incident to when we actually picked up the first picket sign was about two years. And in that time, my grandfather was going to city council meetings and writing letters to the, you know, mayor and such and trying to, and the park commissioners and trying to figure out how to clean up Gage Park because it's this, this ongoing problem. Right. So to, to remind people, there was, there was a park where gay men were, were having sex in the bushes, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I assume all of that's true, right? This was not your grandfather's yeah. malignant not fantasy. Not making this up. Right. No, he wasn't making it up. I mean, he wasn't making up that it was a, that it was a pickup spot. I think once the picketing started and once, once he saw the kind of attention that, that he could get from that kind of activity, that became, you know, it just, it just became this, something that he couldn't turn away from. And even I, I remember at a certain point after we'd been, I was in middle school, so we would, would have been picketing for, you know, nearly 10 years by then. You started when you were five? Yeah. So just before I started kindergarten, I yeah. started picketing. Wow. So, yeah. So I remember being in middle school and, uh, and it became, it was like a discussion they were having with a newspaper, a, a local newspaper about possibly like, like basically if we give you a column, <laughs> a column, a weekly column in the newspaper, will you stop hmm. picketing? Because if your goal is to reach people, you know, this is, this could be a, a possible, you know, this could be a way of doing that. and. And I remember first being aghast that we would even consider this. Like it just, it just, it didn't occur to me that, you know, and then of course, everybody else in the church seemed to come to the same conclusion. Like this was not, this was not an option. Like our place is, you know, there's these phrases from the Bible without the camp. Like we are outside of mainstream society. We are Mm -hmm. not inside talking to these people. We are outside because they have cast us out because they have abhorred God and his message. And so therefore they abhor us. Yeah, well, there's something self-fulfilling about that kind of persecution complex. Once you tell yourselves a vivid enough story of how separate you are from the rest of human society and all that that entails, and you begin to act on that perception, uh, as you did, you then, as if by magic, uh, or some perverse irony, begin to attract all the hatred that seems to confirm your status as everlasting outsiders. And so your, your experience, you write about this in the book, but your experience, even as a young child, standing on the sidewalk picketing, was the experience of just reaping a kind of an infinite amount of hatred from the rest of society. And I can only imagine that experience confirms the sense that, you know, these people are are irretrievably lost and destined for hell. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was those very human dynamics that kind of pushed us further and further to the extreme as time went on, you know, because there are passages, you know, the, the things that that led us to be praying for our enemies to die and for God to do horrible things to them like that, that didn't happen overnight. That was, that was kind of a, a, I mean, in some ways it did happen overnight because it was a sudden shift in doctrine, Mm -hmm. but the theology and the mental state that got us there definitely developed over time. And so, you know, as we're, as time goes on, you know, and the, the louder we get, the more angry the response gets, the more hostile that response gets. And so then you can't help, but even though we were, and this is where, you know, I, I, t- I write about this in the book, like that moment where it finally hits me that I, that I am believing these two completely contradictory things at the same time. I'm holding them in my mind together at the same time, but never in the same moment. So it's this, the sense that, you know, our stated goal for picketing, the reason we were out there was the fulfillment of the commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself. It's the idea that you go and rebuke your neighbor when you see him sinning because you know that the consequences of that sin is death and curses from God in this life and then hell in the next. So ostensibly, we're out there because we love these people and we, we need to go and warn them. 
And yet, because of those dynamics on the picket line, we it just pushed us further and further to the to the extreme of we stopped thinking of them in as our neighbors and people that we loved and that we needed to go and preach this to as their only hope for salvation and started thinking of them as these people who are irredeemably lost and hellbound and cursed by God. And so now we need to pray for God. So we would be demanding, we would be standing out there demanding that people repent. And we hold these signs, repent or perish. And then we go in our prayers as we, as we arrive to the picket and as we leave the picket for God to preserve them in their sins. So it's this, again, this completely contradictory idea is that I, I was simply unaware of at the time. I can't remember if we talked about this last time, but I think, I, th- I, think, I think we must not have because, you know, you started to read on the, on the podcast, The End of Faith, mm. and you, you got to that, the part you kind of paused and told the story of, about being in Paris with your wife mm-hmm. and both at the same time yeah, yeah. trying to avoid the American embassy and then also trying to get a room at a hotel next mm-hmm. to the American embassy. Yeah. yeah. And I think it just has to do with, you know, the way that our you know, minds process information like in certain contexts and we have, you know, different, we compartmentalize. And so we, we can hold these completely contradictory ideas at the same time. We're just, and then when they finally meet, when we finally become aware of them, we, I, I, I don't, I think, I don't know, I can't remember what you said about it, but I literally felt insane. Mm-hmm. How could I have believed both of these things at the same time? And, and the, the phrase preserve them in their sin, that is, that is to say, you're praying that God keep them in ignorance so that they merit the the pain of hell or is or is this have some other meaning no yeah that's exactly right that that's a theme in in islam as well that's you you encounter this a lot in the quran that you know if god had wanted to illuminate them and give them faith mm-hmm. he would have so you know it, it, the fact that the unbelievers are uh, blind to the truth is something that god intends you know, you know it's, it's really a, it's a kind of a perverse vision of a a psychological experiment that's never really honestly run. I mean, it's, it's not like anyone outside the faith ever had a chance when you when you actually look at the details, and that this is considered a good thing, right? And that's actually something that I mean, I still currently, you know, when I I will be reading my family's tweets sometimes, and they're written from a perspective of you know as if it were possible for these people whoever that they're accusing and, you know, demanding repentance from as if it were possible for them to repent, Mm. even while believing in predestination, right? Or that, that things, that anything that they have done could have been otherwise. They don't believe that it could have been otherwise because it happened. It must have happened exactly as God set it up to happen. So it's always very funny when they're, when they, when they try to do that, it's like, but you don't you don't believe that. You don't actually believe that it's possible. And yet you are working yourself up into a frenzy of rage, mm. getting mad at these people and upset with them for, you know, for taking the wrong path and for having done these things that, you know, Westboro imagines will lead them to hell. And yet, from your own perspective, from your own theology, it could not have been otherwise. And so that, like, that was something that I I also kind of would skim over, you know, in my own mind when I was still with Westboro. And mm-hmm. mostly people didn't bring it to our attention. And so now some, sometimes it just becomes, I just have to say something because it's, it is so, I don't know. It, it's like at some point, like, can't you, you hope at some point that they will be able to step back long enough to realize that this doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the footage of these protests because it, there's something it almost has a kind of trolling feel to it. I mean, I know that you guys believed what you said you believed, and but so that was on some level a sincere communication, but it's playful enough and kind of arch enough that it just seems like you're also sort of trolling. I mean, I, can you explain what, how that impression is coming across? Yeah, so, I mean, it was always very important for us to be happy on the picket line and just generally like we we had to be happy to show that we were content with our lot right that mm. god had given us this ministry and we needed to to be joyful about it even when it was difficult and so that that's kind of just a, a big part of just the the church culture i mean it's just so arresting to see 
a little girl of any age beaming, you know, the good vibes of childhood while holding in each hand a sign, you know, damning people to hell. <laughs> and <it's>, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, that, that's why it does have a, perhaps trolling is the wrong framework, but it, there's something not straightforward about the communication. It's just, a, it, it is a kind of goof that on some level is very high stakes and perverse because, you know, he, you know fr- viewed from the outside, what's happening here is really a kind of child abuse. I mean, we have a child, you know, i.e. you, and your siblings in a situation where you're you've been you know truly deprived of you know real world information and have been indoctrinated into this kind of malicious and paranoid worldview and now you're being put to work to spread it and yet you're this happy little thing in a parka with a you know <laughs> a god hates fag sign and it's just mm-hmm. it's just such a mind stopper yeah i mean i think you know when people People look at groups like Westboro, they see them generally as very like uneducated, backwards, unhappy people who are just looking for something, you know, to be mad about. And they have found it in mm. whatever, the gay community or people committing fornication or whatever. Like, so you, you see them as just, and so there is definitely part of that, you know, part of the reason it was so important that we show our happiness on the picket line is, is to thwart that image. And also, you know, there's, there's this Bible passage that my mom would quote all the time about how this is the love of God, that you keep his commandments and that his commandments are not grievous to you. So if God's commandments, if it's grievous to you to follow his commandments, then clearly you're not one of God's elect. You're not one of his people, because even if you follow the letter of the law and your spirit isn't in it, your heart isn't in it. And you're not joyful about it, then that's uh, that is unacceptable service to God. So I feel like there's there's a whole lot of you know, and the fact that we were so happy is part of what and that 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 dichotomy that you described, the juxtaposition between the extremely serious you know negative message and the happiness of the people proclaiming it. Mm. That was part of what you know got so much attention for the church. And were you having? religious experiences that you interpreted as confirmation of your faith? What what was it like, apart from just announcing it on the sidewalk and dealing with the the blowback? I mean, every day we were, you know, reading the Bible, memorizing Bible verses, and and talking about what was happening in the world in light of Westboro's understanding of the scriptures. For me, I mean, I, I never felt like God was like talking to me or something. You know, that that wasn't how I experienced religion. I experienced it as this very rigid set of rules that it was literally only possible to follow if God was giving you the right kind of heart to to want to do it. I experienced religion as as fear, you know, initially especially as a kid because there was so hell. much yeah, fear of hell, mm-hmm. exactly. And and what God would do to you if you stepped out of line. I got baptized when I was 13. I had tried to get baptized a little earlier than that, a few years earlier. But apparently, one of my aunts thought I wasn't serious, so that closed down that discussion. Oh, so you, so in that church you you can't get baptized before you demonstrate that you're actually serious in in some ideological way. Yes, exactly. They, they do not believe in infant baptism. Mm. Actually, I saw on Twitter one of the questions that, that your tweet about this are, are doing this podcast elicited. One of the questions was, what was one of the funniest things that you thought was a sin at the church, you know, now looking back? Mm-hmm. And I think one of the funniest things that I, I wrote about this in the book was when I look back at my grandfather gave a sermon about infant baptism. And without any sense of hyperbole whatsoever, he compared that act of sprinkling some water and saying a few words, you know, about this infant and, and, and their hopes that they go to heaven or whatever, and they're washed in the blood of Jesus. Like, he compared that to literally burning the child alive and sacrifice to a pagan god. And that was exactly, and, and when I look back at that now, that's a little extreme. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, so they do not believe in, in infant baptism at all. So you have to... You have to demonstrate an orderly walk. You have to talk to all of the members of the church. And so they say, like, if there's this question, can any forbid water? So is there any reason that anybody in the church has that you should not be baptized? As long as the answer is no, then then you can be baptized. So, you know, kids as young as like, I think six, seven, eight 
have been baptized at Westboro. Mm. Well, it's a much stronger ceremony. I mean, it, it's, it sounds like it has just far more import to it. I mean, there's obviously no content on the, the infant side where when you're getting baptized and you can't even speak a human right. language. And so this is the real thing. If you are demonstrating you have sufficient commitment to the, to the creed, that's, that's where you yeah. actually transition to something significant. So you were, so you got baptized at 13, but so, so the experience... I forgot where that was coming from. Sorry, you, you yeah. asked a question, but I, I've forgotten what it was that led me there. Yeah, well, it was just well, whether you were having religious, religious experience, experience of any of kind I mean, and, and interpreting anything in the world apart from the, the harassment you were getting from the outside as confirmation of the, of the truth of your faith. Yeah, I mean, obviously that the interaction with outsiders and how much they hated it, you know, especially given all those passages in the New Testament where Jesus is saying, if you follow me, the world is going to hate you. Yeah. You know, blessed are ye when men shall hate you and revile you and persecute you for my name's sake, for so did their fathers to the prophets. So we saw ourselves in that, you know, in that line of righteous people who had who had delivered the word of God to a world that that despised them and it. That, so there's no question that was a huge part of it. But, you know, just because of how, you know, everything in the church, you know, this, this extraordinary amount of love and support that you get as a church member, as long as you are a member in good standing, all of those, you know, I felt enveloped in the love of God, you know, by those things. Mm. And because they teach you, you know, your own worthlessness from such a young age that you are of yourself, you have nothing that God didn't give you and, and that, you know, of your, you know, any, any part of you, you know, that's you, like that's, that's all corrupt. And, and, you know, there's this passage that talks about their righteousness is as filthy rags, right? So it's just, you, you are taught from such a young age that you are nothing and that you have nothing and that all things come from God. And so, you know, the sense that the idea that you could have this really wonderful family and people who loved and cared about you and showed you that in innumerable ways, you know, all of that felt like a, a wonderful gift from God. You know, I, I felt you know, the same way singing in church on Sundays, you know, all these songs that talk about how worthless you are as a human being and how graceful God is and how merciful to have taken any pity on you and given you, you know, any good thing. That just tells you how what a wonderful God he is and how generous, because clearly you are too worthless to deserve any of this on your own. Yeah. Well, it really is a complex picture because, you know, at, at first glance from outside, again, this just seems like pure misfortune. I mean, you were unlucky to be born to the people you were born to and insulated from sort of a normal, happy life in the modern world. And you're very lucky to have gotten out, and I, I would cer certainly sign off on the on that final claim. But your experience of being in your family and being your your mother's daughter and your father's daughter, uh, and even your grandfather's granddaughter, is far more complex than that. And and I mean, you are clearly a remarkable person, and you you got some gifts from this ordeal as well. I mean, how, just how do you view your childhood and and what you got from this experience. You know, I, I think about this a lot now because I now that I am a mother and and the kinds of things that I want, you know, there there are so many aspects of my upbringing that I want to give my daughter. And, and you know, I, I think I talked about this. I think I talked about this last time. I definitely wrote about it in the book. And it's mm. something that was really powerful to me. This moment where it was just a few months after I left and I was, you know, at the Shabbat table of this rabbi that I had protested, you know, a few years earlier with this, you know, your rabbi is a whore sign mm -hmm. being held by my sister. And David Abbotball, who he was the one who invited me there and he had he was the one who made that first point on Twitter that first allowed me to, in my own mind, challenge Westboro's teachings. So as I'm sitting there with him just a few months after I left and feeling like a complete betrayer that there was, I had, you know, completely, I walked away from, from my family and everyone I loved and, 
having betrayed everything that I stood for and and I just felt so overcome with guilt and shame and 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 you know in that moment for David what he said was you know in a lot of ways leaving Westboro Baptist Church was the most Westboro Baptist Church thing you could have done they're the ones he what, what he, to, he told me and my sister he said you are your parents children they're the ones that taught you to stand up for what you believe in no mm. matter what it cost you they just never imagined you'd be standing up to them mm. And that was the first time I realized that I, because I basically had accepted Westboro's framing of the whole situation, you know, that I had walked away from my family, that I had rejected all these people that I loved. And, you know, being able to start to see it with nuance and to realize, no, I didn't walk away from my family. I walked away from the church. I walked away from an ideology that I saw had come to see as extremely destructive, not just for the people that the church targeted, but for the church itself and, and all of its members. And then, and then also to, to look, and look back and realize that there was so much of my upbringing that was really wonderful. I mean, it's the idea of, and, and of course, you, know, you have to also keep in mind all of the destructive parts of it. Like, it's not like I'm, I'm not trying to take away from the destructiveness of it or, or the pain that we cause so many other people. But to to look back and see this this idea of you know that we were motivated by you know at least initially by this desire to love our neighbor right that we as a group of seventy to eighty people could be so dedicated and so active that we could get that much you know attention for our cause and it's not just attention right it's it's this idea of dedicating yourself to something and sacrificing for it in such a way that you you can accomplish the objectives that you set out to so like that kind of you know perseverance and the diligence the hard work that went into that the very you know spending so much time trying to get to the bottom of a thing and examining it from so many different angles so obviously i think you know now a lot of the things that we spent a lot of time on were not good but the process itself is something that i absolutely still want to emulate, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you mentioned Twitter a couple of times, and you are really, if, if anyone is a social media success story, it is you, because Twitter was your way out of this. And uh, you then met your husband on Twitter. Tell me why Twitter is a good thing for one person <laughs> on this earth. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, Twitter, yes, Twitter was the way out. That was another question that somebody asked in response to your tweet yesterday was, it was about, do you think you would still be part of Westboro if not for Twitter? And I have every reason to believe that I would be because even though, you know, and I, I, read, I read about this in the book, this whole process of this group of, you know, older men in the church kind of taking over as the, you know, becoming the elders, like taking over as this, you know, this church leadership role. And, and a bunch of other things that happened that helped me see that we were doing wrong. But I just, I have every reason to believe that without those conversations on Twitter, without having come to the realization that we could be wrong about something, before that conversation with David Abbott Ball, you know, where he points out this internal contradiction in our theology, before that, I always felt like I had the answer to everything. There was not you know, we spent hours, hours, hundreds, thousands of hours on the picket line talking to people about these doctrines and Westboro's theology. And, you know, there wasn't a person outside of our church who agreed with it all. And so we're constantly being challenged by it. And, you know, doing that from the time I was five years old and, you know, by the time I'm, you know, in my mid-20s on Twitter, the feeling that we had an answer for everything, that the doctrine was airtight you mentioned that my family is full of lawyers and that's, they're extremely intelligent, analytical people. And we spent a lot of time memorizing the evidence, aka the Bible, so that, that we always were ready to give an answer to the people who ask these questions. So I had so much faith in the church and their understanding of the Bible, their interpretation of how the world worked. And I've mentioned all this, the sense that you have of yourself as being just this depraved human being and, and, you know, that Bible verse about how you can't trust your heart. 
the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and who can know it. So having that be your framework and then having this, this group of people who it feels like this divine, unquestionable institution. Until that came into question for me because of those conversations on Twitter, anytime something didn't quite make sense, I always assumed that the problem was in me, right. that the error was in my own thinking or because I had some kind of depraved heart or Satan was whispering in my ear. You know, those, this is the framework I was dealing with. Yeah, I mean, and that is the way any religion or cult hermetically seals itself against criticism from the outside. I mean, so, so any point that seems unanswerable or, you know, any blow that seems to land can be reinterpreted as, you know, your own fallibility. You can't trust your own intuitions here. Who can understand God's ways or that, you know, you're actually in dialogue with and being tempted by Satan or some, mm -hmm. you know, divine adversary? Yep. Yeah. And that, that was, if not for Twitter, I just have, I have every reason to believe that I would have continued to do the same thing I had always done. So what was the moment on Twitter where the, the first domino fell? Do you remember the, the precise point that was being made? Yes. We talked about this last time. This, yeah. It was this conversation about the, the sign calling for the death penalty for gays. And, and so David Abbottball, in this conversation, he's kind of he says two things that there were arguments that people had made before, but that we, our response, you know, had always made sense to me. Remind me, David is an Orthodox Jew? Yes, David yeah. is an Orthodox Jew living yeah. in Jerusalem. Right. And you, you had told him that his rabbi was a whore? Yes. Right. We, okay. had, we had that, that picket sign. We had That's always a nice icebreaker. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. great. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, luckily, it's just so funny to me when I think about this, like, well, shoot, I don't want to get too off track. Okay. Oh, we should come, maybe come back to this, but like the question of like, why are Jewish people so often, I mean, like it, I've heard this from in, in a lot of these stories, like, so my friend Derek Black, this former white nationalist, for him, it was also like conversations with Jewish people mm -hmm. that was part of, and I think it seems, I mean, it seems like questioning is such a, a big part of at least the Jewish communities that I've been part of, you know, the questioning, like questioning at Westboro was not seen as a good thing. And when I say questioning, I don't mean asking questions. I mean literally casting doubts on the accepted view of things. Mm. Well, when we're not running that Zionist banking conspiracy or taking over the media or <laughs> right. uh, busily replacing all the white people, we've got the free time to have arguments like this. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, so like, there's, 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 there are questions there. But anyway, back to the, the, the conversation I was having with David, so, you know, I'm justifying that sign calling for the death penalty for gays by pointing to the passage in Leviticus and saying, you know, if that punishment was good enough for God, then it's good enough for us. And it should absolutely be the law of the land. And so when, you know, David says, well, didn't Jesus say, let he who is without sin cast the first stone? And I, our response to that had always been, it's like, we're not casting stones, we're preaching words. And he said, yeah, but you're advocating that the government cast stones. And isn't that what that passage is talking about? And so as he says that, I was kind of like, oh, hmm. <laughs> and then he keeps going. He's, he pointed to my mother and he said, and didn't your mother have a child out of wedlock? And isn't that, that another sin that deserved the death penalty? And it was kind of like, it hit me that, you know, for the first time that one, that is what Jesus is talking about there. It's not just a general call to humility, which is kind of how I had seen it before. It is, he's literally talking about the death penalty, people getting ready to stone this woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the realization that if my mother had been stoned for that sin, you know, we argued she didn't, you know, she, she had repented. So she didn't, you know, she didn't deserve, you know, that punishment. And so the idea of, that if she had been killed for her sin, that she would not have had the opportunity to repent and be forgiven, that my family wouldn't exist. You know, just all of this kind of comes crashing down at once. And I think the way I ended that conversation was to say, because like, I, I don't think I actually explicitly acknowledged the contradiction, although I had in my own mind. What I said was something like, you want me to say that this is okay, this lifestyle, this, you know, being gay, that this is okay. And I won't do it. 
because the Bible doesn't say it's okay. So that's kind of how I ended the conversation. And then I mm. stopped talking to him because I had been bested, right? I had never felt like I had been bested before because even if in a moment I didn't have, you know, the specific verse, although that even that rarely happened, I knew that I could always go to one of the older people in the church and or to the Bible myself and find the answer. Mm. But yeah, this was the first time acknowledging that internal contradiction. Did you go back to your mom or any elder in the church with this particular concern? I did, to my mom and a couple others. I didn't mention the part about what he said about her because I wasn't, right. you know, I didn't want to, it would seem, would seem very, you know, disrespectful and not right to say that, that to her. Right. Although that, that really seems like the, the strongest point in that it does. litany. Yeah, yeah, it does. It seems like she would have to say, at the time, it would have been right to have stoned me. Right. Yeah. I, and I don't know. I don't, I really don't know how. I just know that when I, when I presented the, the point about Jesus did actually say that, and I still don't know how, how they continue to justify that, right? You know, him saying only the sinless should cast stones. Mm. Who among us could do that? You know, they will, they will all like readily acknowledge their own sinfulness and yet at the same time defend that position. So anyway, when, when I brought that to my, to my mom, that the response was just this kind of the accusation that I was getting wrapped around an axle and that clearly the, the standard is against gays and that that's the only way for this nation to prove that they have truly repented of this abominable lifestyle. I mean, that scared me, obviously. It scared me that I couldn't get over this thing, that it seemed so clear to me and it seemed so clear in a different way to my mom. And the idea that, that there could be some conflict there was terrifying. So I just kind of, and not deliberately, but I, I mean, I stopped holding the sign, but I, I just kind of suppressed it. So how long did it take you to leave after that? It was two years from, that, from the time of that conversation to, hmm. and it was a year and a half from that conversation to when I first came to the conclusion that Westboro's problems were not just these relatively small points of theology. And so for, basically, so from the moment I first had this realization of, oh my God, what if we're just people? Hmm. Like, what if this isn't this divine institution from God? From that moment, I, I never, I never was a, 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 a full believer anymore. That would be a great meme. I, I want to see that sign. Oh my God, what if we're just people? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's, what's so funny about that is that this has been my Twitter bio for a long time. This or part of it has been this quote that my mom, and I referenced it in my TED Talk a couple years ago, where she tells me, you know, as I'm, because, because once I come to that, that, that question, right, I become desperate because there's only two, two ways to go here. Either I stay and keep living this life that I now no longer believe in, which didn't, that wasn't an option. That's just because of the way my family raised me, the dishonesty of it among so many other things. Like that, I, that was never an option. The other side of this is leaving and losing everyone and everything and being left to a world that I'd spent my whole life antagonizing. And so I just became desperate to try to get them to see differently. And so, you know, I started asking questions. So in one of these conversations I'm having with my mom, at first I'm as, as careful as I can be to not, like, just to not betray how deep these doubts have become. Because mm. I'm just, I'm trying to, but as time goes on, I'm becoming more and more open about it because I have, the closer we come to leaving, the less I have to lose, you know? Right. And so in one of these conversations, I have just totally worked myself up into a frenzy, just overcome, and I'm weeping so hard. And my mom says to me, you're just a human being, my dear, sweet child. Like, you know, you're just a person, mm. and this is the divine truth. And, and these elders that you're questioning, you're questioning their actions and, and the, like, how how biblical or unbiblical what they're doing is, basically, you don't have space to ask those questions. Like, this is not your place. And when she said that, I just cried harder because I had come to this conclusion. I had come to believe that we're all just human beings. Why do we think 
we have like knowing our own history, looking back, and and there are so many things in Westboro's history that they will look back and acknowledge as being sinful and wrong. And yet knowing that, they still have such belief and certainty in their own righteousness, in the rightness of their cause, in spite of all the mistakes and the idea of not seeing those things and being humbled by them, like coming to this, being able to acknowledge to themselves and to others that they are just people, just like everyone else, trying to figure out what the right answer is, what the right path is. And that certainty for them just leads them to say and do things to themselves and others that are just incredibly. So anyways, this this whole, what if we're just people? Yeah, it's like, it's, hmm. that was a huge part of it. Now, were you trying to keep this between you and your mom or were you just ricocheting all over your family, dealing with brothers and your father and your sisters? How was this unraveling happening for you? Ricocheting is, is a perfect word for it because I was trying to, I was trying to keep it under wraps, but again, because we spent so much time with one another and because I had been such a like loud and zealous voice for the church for so long, as soon as I started having real problems, like again, it's that, it was that moment of what, you know, the what if we're just people moment, like from then on, like I, I almost completely stopped posting on Twitter, which I had done all the time everywhere. Like it was there was like a misprint in, uh, mm. I, d- I did this, um, this did interviews for this profile in the Kansas City Star, and there's a photo that had a, a misprint on the caption that they said something about my iPhone hand <laughs> instead mm. of iPhone in hand or something. And I was like, that is so perfect because I constantly was on Twitter like debating people and I just thought it was such a great way of, of reaching people. And I largely stopped tweeting. I, you know, had been so happy and, and again, just, you know, doing interviews all the time. And, and I just became, it was like, I had never had problems before. And now I'm talking to a few different elders, my, my oldest brother who had become an elder, my dad, my mom, my grandmother, my siblings, and my cousins, you know, as you know, the longer time went on, like I, I, I tried to keep it kind of isolated at first. And then I just, I couldn't, there, there was just, there was no way of, of really suppressing it because it had just totally taken over my thoughts. Okay. So then you wind up absconding with your sister and you leave and, and it's really an amazing thing to leave your family and, and the entire world you knew to set out into this world that you have spent your entire life antagonizing. Tell me about the, um, just amazingly synchronous Museum of Tolerance episode you describe at the end of the book. What, what happened? How did you get to the Museum of Tolerance and what was that like? So David, again, David comes through in this story like a lot because yeah. he, he just had, he was such a wonderful and wonderfully thoughtful person. So after we left, it was just a couple months later and I was talking to him and explaining his role in my eventual departure from the church, why I had stopped talking to him. And so he invites my sister and me to come to the Julicious Festival that was put on by this, the rabbi and Rabbi Yona Buchstein and his wife and their, their four kids. So we stayed with them at their home. David was like staying in their, you know, little guest house. And so he's, he's really taken us under his wing. So he takes us to the Museum of Tolerance because it's, it's really close to where the rabbi lives. And, uh, you know, I felt at that point kind of a little bit wounded by that, like this, this feeling of, you know, like, didn't I just leave my whole family because, because I thought that what they're doing is wrong and all this stuff that I dedicated my life to. So like, it's funny looking back at all these little, I think people think if you leave, you know, everything just kind of turns around at once and that's not how it happens. But I recognized in myself that resistance and, and wanted to do everything that I could to, to be deliberate about forming new experiences to replace this one way of seeing the world that I'd had for so long. So we go to the Museum of Tolerance and we're, we're listening to like the introduction from this docent. And, and as soon as she starts talking, I realized like there's going to be something about Westboro in here. And it was literally in the first exhibit, there was a picture of my sister and my grandmother protesting outside of, it was, you know, Matthew Shepard had been murdered. They were, they picketed 
Matthew Shepard's funeral, but they also protested the trial of his murderers. Because the, the murderers were just agents of God's justice? Uh, yes. Yep. They were agents of God's justice, but they themselves were, were also sinners. Like God, mm. you know, my mom would quote, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but yes, right. the answer is yes. Yeah. So as we're standing there, this, you know, group of young, young kids who are there like as a class come over and we're listening to, they're listening to this museum guide describe, you know, this exhibit or whatever. And, uh, and right then David says, that's their family. You know, that's their grandmother. And the, the guide was like, what? And, you know, he tells them just a little bit of the story. And you're now part of the exhibit. Right, right. And the kids just look at my sister and me who are like, you know, wearing sundresses and cardigans <laughs> and like can't believe that we were part of this. So they start asking us these questions. And so we go through this whole, this whole conversation. And that was the first time we had talked we had spoken publicly about it. Like we'd been talking mm. to David about it, but there's, there had never, it had always been with people that had known us before, like while we were still at the church. And it actually ended up being like, it was scary. And it again gave me that sense of, you know, that I was betraying my family, but it was a really good experience. And then, and then at the end of all of that, you know, we end up back in the lobby of the museum and David explains this concept from Judaism to us, to my sister and me, that, that really resonated with both of us. And it's the idea, the idea of tikkun olam, which means hmm. to repair the world. So it's this, David, David explained it to us as this idea that it is incumbent upon every human being to see the brokenness in the world and to try to do what they can to fix it, to repair it. And, you know, he pointed out that we had spent a lot of years adding to the brokenness in the world and that we should try to do something. And we both really wanted to. And having that be, like having that framework was really wonderful for us, I think. And for, definitely for me. Mm. Because Westboro had been so, like we had no hope for the people outside. They were all hell bound. They were all doomed and going to hell. And the idea that we could do something positive and, and to help other people was, was really wonderful. And, and we really wanted to. Hmm. So you must have seen the uh, Louis Theroux documentary, the, the most recent one. You're in it. I just assume you've seen it since it came out. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that had to be kind of hard. I mean, you're, he interviews your mom about your leaving. Yep. And I mean, what was that like? It was, it, it was such, you know, I can't really imagine what it was like for you to watch that. I mean, she's clearly broken up over having lost contact with you and your sister. And yet, you know, her dogmatism is apparently unshaken, but it was just, it was such a, I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing footage of her kind of wrestling with her, with her grief and her faith. And, you know, Louis's style of interviewing is, he's, he's just so deadpan and, and he just he just lets it turns hey, into yeah. a, a kind of a, a robot and just lets his interviewee process the consequences of his question is very effective but what was that like to for you to watch extremely painful you know there was you know when i first left i kind of was of two minds one i kind of you know with my i have one i mentioned i have one brother who left the church before i did and the way that my mom processed that for, I mean, we were all for about a week or so after he left, we were all allowed to cry and mourn and, and be upset about it. And then after that time, you know, my mom came upon me crying and she said, you know, we're going to make the Lord mad at us if we are unthankful for this, because this is, you know, this is one of his judgments. And, you know, we, we, we say that we have to thank God for everything. We actually have to thank God for everything. And from then on, like when he would come up, she had, she just had this very hard line stance, you know, the way that she talked about him to other people. And it was this kind of very dismissive. And so part of me, when I left, part of me hoped that she would do that to me because it was much less painful mm. to think about it and to frame it in those terms than it was to think about, you know, how painful it was, his absence, to think about what we had lost. 
And so there's part of me that kind of hoped that she would do the same thing to me. And then of course there was a, a huge part of me that that wanted her not to do that. You know, like I I didn't it was unbearable to think of my mom, who I had been so close with, to think about her talking about me that way and seeing me that way. And so, but I had kind of comforted myself with the idea that that's what she would do. And then about a year and a half after I left, my brother Zach left and he disabused me of that notion. That was not how she had responded. That she, even even after, even as he, leading up to the time of his leaving, he would still come upon her crying and, you know, being upset about it all. And that was, again, it, I had two responses. I was, I was happy that she didn't, you know, hate me, but also so pained to think about her in that situation and, and feeling she, she, she is trapped, right? She is not, she is not free to make a different decision. And this was one of the things, you know, and I, I think I said something, I, I emailed Louis about this because he's, I think he called her a, a self-created victim, you know, after, after that scene where she is hmm. describing all of this to him and her perspective on him. He called her a self-created victim. And I just, I don't agree with that. I know that it seems like a choice for her to not have contact with me, for her to continue to do the things that she's doing. But she was, just like I was, she was indoctrinated from the time she was a kid. And in some ways, that indoctrination was even more extreme than mine was. And she has not had, I was very, you said I was lucky to get out, and you're right. You know, I was very lucky to have the experiences that I had, that people were willing to have those conversations with me. Because it was only because of those experiences that it did become a choice for me to leave. And not just a choice, but kind of it's really funny. I, I struggle to talk about free will. I don't, I mean, you know, to explain exactly why I hmm. don't believe in it. But I mean, just just the fact that we are, I feel like we're at the product of our our biology and our environment. And none of that is our choice. Like the things that led have led my mom to this extremely dogmatic position, that's what she knows. And before she ever could doubt or question those things. They were drilled into her and her and any other response, any other way of seeing things so demonized. And, you know, obviously I, part of my reaching back is it is to help the targets of Westboro. It's also to help Westboro themselves to see outside of this extremely, you know, limiting and dogmatic paradigm that the vast majority of them were had drummed into them from the time they were very young. Is part of the grief and despair born of the fact that according to Westboro Doctrine, she must believe that you and your, your siblings who have left are going to hell? Yeah, absolutely. She fears for our souls. And I, I know that I'm sure that my dad does. My dad does too. Was your dad in the documentary or, or not? I don't remember. A that. little bit. <laughs> he, mm. he was in the part where it was really funny. He he yawned during the church service mm -hmm. and they put it in there right. as a way of showing how, how boring things have become since yeah. Graham's passed away, right. which I thought that was a little unfair, but also yeah. it was nice to see my dad. Yeah, but was, yeah, he wasn't interviewed for it. That was gratuitous editing, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, so, so Louis makes a lot of the fact that your, your grandfather died and that has changed things, but even before he died, there's controversy about just what his state of mind was with respect to church doctrine at the end, and that whether born of a change of heart or incipient dementia or both, he it sounds like he said some things or did some things that were in fairly flagrant violation of church teaching. Maybe you want to describe what you, you think happened there and, and what you think it meant. Yeah, I mean... So there were a, a lot happened. The way that I experienced it was that, you know, looking at Westboro's Twitter feeds and, you know, over time and realizing that my grandfather had suddenly stopped giving sermons. So I thought something was wrong. I thought he must have gotten sick because now the, the elders were giving the sermons every week. And so a few months passed and then my brother Zach left and I talked to him, you know, I'm talking to him on the phone. 
And he's explaining to me that Gramps at that point was in hospice, was in, he was very sick, and that he had been voted out of the church. And when I asked Zach what had happened, he said that the day that Gramps was voted out of the church, excommunicated, he had gone out onto the front lawn of the church and had said to the, you know, so the, we talked about, I think, the Equality House. So there's this organization called Planting Peace that bought a house across the street from Westboro and painted it rainbow colors, kind of as a standing symbol against the church and in support of the LGBTQ community. So he, Gramps had gone out onto the front lawn of the church and called out to them and said that they were good people. And, you know, Zach said that, you know, they have this, the church has a meeting of just the members. And that was the proximate cause of his getting voted out of the church that he had cast in his lot with the sodomites. That's how they put it, according to my brother. Hmm. So, and that was, that was after, you know, I, I mentioned in, you know, in the book about how Gramps had been, you know, when the elders took over, Gramps had been this voice. They were very, <laughs> I was going to say, they were very doctrinaire, like Gramps was. But Gramps, I mean, they, they had just, it was like, it was like they had been just overcome with this need to punish and to, you know, exact their own sense of like what, what order should be in the church. And what that looked like from where I sat was a suppression of, you know, sort of this multiplication of rules, new rules for, for people to follow. And then this suppression of any, any dissent. You know, the idea that anybody would disagree or, or try to thwart, you know, any of the things that they wanted to do. So that's, that's how it appeared to me. And Gramps was kind of a counterpoint to that. Like he, he was not aware, he was not kept aware of everything that was going on. But I know that he sensed something and, and some of the things that were going on. And he would constantly talk about this passage. There was this, it says, only by pride cometh contention. So he was constantly talking about humility and the need to have great humility so that there would be no contention in the church. So it was kind of this softening from, he had always been doctrinaire and very hard line about things. And it, he seemed to be softening in, in certain ways as he got older in those last couple of years before I left. The fact that that was the proximate cause of his getting kicked out, you know, I don't have a lot of trust in the church's judgments. And the way that they, the way that they think about people, but clearly they thought that he was in his right mind when that happened, or else they would not have used that as a, as a reason for excluding him, as the main reason for their exclusion of him. So that's why I have come to the, you know, I, I don't know everything. I know that he was very sick, and I know that, you know, when I saw him a few weeks before he died. Yeah, about three, it was about three weeks, less than three weeks before he died. He definitely was not, you know, all there all the time, but there were definitely moments where he was. But yeah, anyway, that's, that's all the facts as I understand them. So, so what contact have you had with your mom and the rest of your family in recent years? I reach out to them regularly. I send, you know, letters and postcards and birthday gifts and... Anytime the spirit moves me, I, I try to reach out. Sometimes I think I want to, and I just can't bring myself to do it. It still can be very painful sometimes. I do reach out to them privately. I also do it on Twitter because that's something that I know that all my siblings and cousins, like everybody's on the internet. And mm -hmm. so it w they can go, that's not something, what I post on the internet is not something, like they can't hide that from them. And so... So I do it privately and publicly. So have you seen your mom in recent years? I saw my mom in 2016. I had gotten engaged a few months earlier, and this was one of the things that I, I didn't want to tell her in a letter. It just didn't feel right. And I was in New York one day at the end of March, and... I saw on Twitter that, you know, I knew that they were protesting, they were getting, they were going to be protesting in New York. I didn't know who was going to be there until that morning. My mom, my mom tweeted about um, how God was going to bring this plane safely to New York. And so I knew she was going to be there. And then I saw that my, 
my sister was going to be there too. And so I went out with my sister, Grace. And so there was, you know, it was, there's only four people at the picket. It was my mom, my sister, Becca, and then two of my aunts. And so we, you know, I'm glad I thought very carefully about what I wanted to say before I went up there, because of course, like with the adrenaline and everything else, they, because, you know, from, from West Bro's perspective, like these situations just do not happen. And it's, it's hard to describe the feeling that you get of you're trespassing some, some very deep thing when you see them in public. And if you, and if you say anything to them, even more so. So I walked up and the first thing that happened was that my aunt, one of my aunts started, she, you know, she yells out, get out of here, you riffraff. Why don't you riffraff go across the street? With the counter protesters. Mm. And then my other aunt, you know, hears I start to I start to say to my mom about being engaged, and she just looks like she's seen a ghost, right? She's how far away are you at this point? She's probably about eight feet. Like she's kind of oh. there's like there's a barricade between us right. and so she she's she's right there. It's like a, it's a very kind of closed in space. And she her body though was kind of she was oriented toward the street, like preaching to the cars driving by Mm -hmm. and um she just keeps looking over her shoulder like she's seen a ghost or something and she she looks shocked and like she can't speak she never actually said anything Mm. i started to i started to explain about the engagement and then my other aunt like hears something going on and turns around And she used this tactic that we always use like if some big burly guy was coming after us like we didn't believe in fighting but like you just make yourself like as big as possible and then yell <laughs> like to try mm. to scare them, intimidate mm. them from continuing. That apparently works with bears. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, she was trying to get it to work with me. I'm glad, again, like if I hadn't thought about even like the specific words that I wanted to say, I would not have been able to say anything. She was just, she just started screaming over and over again. So she makes herself really big. She's holding four signs. And she just says, get away from her. Get out of here. And she just keeps repeating, get out of here over and over again at the top of her lungs. And I said, so every time she would take a breath, I would say a few more words. And I just said, I promised my sister, my sister who is just standing right on the other side of the barricade, right next to my aunt. I said, I promised my sister that I would tell her when I found someone that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And I have, and we're engaged and we love you guys so much and get out of here and Mm. i just you know smiled and waved and told him we loved him again and and walked away Hmm. wow that is a crazy experience (laughs) this is this is why a a big part of why i don't i don't think it helps specifically for me but i think generally engaging them on the picket line when they are in that you know it's this very hostile like they they experience that as this very us them environment Mm. and and i just don't think it's this is why twitter was such a valuable thing for me because having this the buffer of time and space between me and these people that i had had been so demonized in my mind for so long you know it was we were able to develop rapport that was would never have been possible on the picket line and they were able to you know get into the nuances of our of our theology in a way that you could never do at a picket, which, you know, their pickets are just too short and too, too confrontational, too hostile. So. Well, speaking of Twitter, we have a few questions. I'm not going to hit you with all of them. It's amazing. How, I, you know, again, you're, you are really the, the ultimate poster girl for the, the importance of Twitter, but it's just, you know, I consider it a cesspool. And even in soliciting questions, I see evidence of its Cesspoolness. irredeemability. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing what comes back. But one recurrent question, I'm not sure, I don't think you wanted to answer this last time. Something may have changed, but many people want to know what your current religious views are. I am not religious at all. I, and I, again, you talked about like not giving ourselves labels and I don't, I mean, it's it's not because you said so. It's just because it doesn't feel, I don't feel comfortable doing it. I mean, I Mm. can just say like, I, I really believe in people. I believe that, I mean, the fact that, you know, kind people on Twitter were able to overcome a lifetime of religious indoctrination, that is insane to me and amazing. And it just shows the power of human connection. And I mean, since I left the church, 
obviously, I, I think maybe part of the reason I have such a positive view of humanity now is that like it was so intensely negative at Westboro forever. Hmm. And then so just the fact that it's not as bad as I was taught is cause for extreme rejoicing. But no, I mean, I just, I've just met really wonderful people. And, and, and to know that even the people who are, even people who are behaving badly, are they're largely doing it, you know, outside of, you know, r- relatively rare cases of like actual sociopaths or psychopaths. Like there are people who are, who are living their experiences. They are, they're doing what they have come to believe is the way to do things. And yeah. the possibility of reaching those people with, you know, relatively, I mean, it wasn't a lot of people who were, you know, who reached out to me. I mean, there was, it was a group of people. And so anyway, and I just, I just have, I just have so much hope for people. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see how hopeful you are for the, this next interlocutor. Uh, this is my, this is my favorite question. How does it feel to be the children of the flame? Allah has sent you guidance, but your ignorance blinds you. And you convince yourself that you know better than Allah, but harsh shall be your punishment. You will be the utter losers. It's kind of a rhetorical question, but what I love about this communication is that it's that there's not an atom in my body, and presumably there's not an atom in yours, that resonates with the fear that maybe we're going to hell because we haven't converted to Islam. Right. And and the thing that's amazing about that just as a pedagogical fact is that this is also true of your every member of your family, right? I mean, that mm-hmm. they would find this kind of question laughable as well. And yet they really wouldn't see that by analogy they're playing the same game. Right. I mean, is that something that has that has that ever happened? Was that ever did you ever when you were a part of the church? And you saw that there were other cults and other fundamentalist orientations to religion that were playing the same game you were. They just had different pieces. Particulars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Did you ever find that troubling or is that just you you never actually considered that it, it had any leverage for you? Well, so it's really funny thinking about it now. For me, it happened in, I took a mythology class in high school. and. It definitely came to a point where it was impossible not to see the parallels between like the idea that, you know, bad things are happening. Like, I'm saying like people who worshiped like, uh, like, I don't know, the Greek and Roman gods, like, well, bad things happen to you on the sea because you made Poseidon angry or whatever. Mm. And, and realizing that we were making the exact same arguments, but like you come, like the thing that I would always come back to was, and even it's just like, well, ours is the real God, right? Hmm. So it's just, and that's, it's a very, um, it's a very strange thing to think back on. I wonder if like there had been like some more explicit discussion, like obviously the teacher couldn't have done it, hmm. but maybe if another student had, had said something at that point that it would have been something that would have resonated with me. You know, but like, but that's that's what they go back to. It's like, well, all these other people are wrong, and you can tell that they're wrong because their holy books have X, Y, Z clearly immoral things in them. Meanwhile, they completely ignore the immoral X, Y, Z things in their mm-hmm. own scriptures. I mean, I think I mentioned one of them to you by email once. Like the last three chapters of the Book of Judges, that was one of, one of the things that I thought about. Like in the first moment, it occurred to me that the Bible might not be the literal, infallible Word of God, and was so glad to be able to think in my own mind, that is bullshit. Like, that was literally my thought. Where is this? Is this children getting eaten by bears? Or I forget what's in Judges. No, it's, <laughs> um, man, it's this really crazy story about this, this, this guy. Slevite had a concubine, and she cheated on him and then ran away to her father's house, and he goes to like bring her back and is convinced just to stay for several days. And finally, the, the last day, he's like, he tells his father-in-law, nope, we're getting out of here. And so they leave, but it, they leave too late in the day to get it all the way home. And so they stop in a city of, in the tribe of Benjamin called Gibeah on their way home. And, you know, they were just going to sleep in the street because, you know, this is Israel. It's supposed to be safe. And this old man comes and tells them not to stay in the street. 
and the, but to come, you know, stay in his house and he'll take care of them and their animals and everything's going to be great. Well, then that night, like the same thing, it's a lot of the same language even of like what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah where mm. the house is surrounded by these men who want to rape the man and right. instead of like they offer the old man's like daughter and and the the, the concubine that, that ran away the husband yeah. actually like sends the concubine out there and she is literally raped to death and like so she comes says her hands are on the threshold of the door like as you know it says when the day began to began to spring they, they let her go so the the husband opens the door and finds the woman with her hands on the threshold and says up and let us be going <laughs> and that's that's the if that if if you're not already like freaked out <laughs> reading this like that's that's the first place you're like what the hell is wrong with this guy and the story just gets more and more insane from there like he cuts her into 12 pieces and sends her to all the tribes and they have this civil war and like 65,000 mm. end up you know dying and the tribe of Benjamin is almost completely wiped out and sorry this is a long story but then like so now that they find out there's like 600 men left Anyways, it's, it's just just go read the story. Like it's it's still even worse from there. Like it's Who just could doubt terrible. That this is the best book of moral instruction ever written. <laughs> right, right. I mean, just, and I just every line sells it. Oh my god! But like literally, it just gets more insane from there. So seriously, just go read it. It's only three chapters. <laughs> okay, back to Peter, <laughs> which is eminently wise by comparison. So, what is the best way to engage religious fundamentalists so as to produce some positive change? I think so. I mean, I, I gave this TED talk two years ago, and and it's basically just a summation of what people did for me on Twitter. And the four points that I outlined were, you know, don't assume bad intent, ask questions, stay calm, and and make your argument. Like you have to actually, you have to actually make an argument, not just assume that the goodness of your position will will be enough to get through to the person on the other side. And so it's to answer the specific question about religious fundamentalists, like I think asking questions is a huge part of this because you really want to understand exactly what, what is their, what are their beliefs, right? Like if you are going to make an argument that will actually reach them, people were constantly making arguments to us at Westboro, but they were often, very often arguing with positions that we didn't even hold. Mm -hmm. They were general of, I mean, they were general beliefs that a, many other religious fundamentalists believed, but we didn't. And so you really want to ask questions and, and dig into what, they're actually, what they actually believe. I think it helps a lot to start with things like trying to look at the internal inconsistencies and contradictions, because I think for people who, especially for people who have been raised in that, that, that like very dogmatic way of thinking, they're not going to be able to jump right into, you know, questioning the validity of the Bible as a whole, for instance, or whatever the or whatever the text is. They have just been trained already to to dismiss those kinds of questions out of hand. Like, well, they just have faith and that's that's it, right? So it helps a lot if you can find the internal inconsistencies. And for so many other fundamentalists who have left, many of them point to like that being the beginning of the thread that unravels the whole thing eventually. Mm. So anyway, that's, it sounds really pretentious to say, go watch my TED talk, but there's, there's, I'm really just, again, summing up what I learned from the way that other people engage me. I stole all their best material and, and, and put it in that talk. Mm. And the last thing I will say though, is like, if I had had time, I would have put a fifth point in there about patience, the importance of patience. And that's because you know, people, especially when they are, when they have such, you know, rigid ideology, they, it's, you can't just turn on a dime. You don't just immediately lose all of that. And so it takes time, but it's absolutely worth asking the questions if you, if you feel compelled to, and if you, if you have the time and, and energy and, and, and want to use a little bit of it. Yeah. Mm. There's actually a related question here. Would this approach apply without real modification to uh, hateful terrestrial ideologies like white supremacy and you know neo-nazi thinking i mean how w would you approach that conversation any differently or or is that the, is it the same same process of patience and understanding and argument and questions 
I think it's the same. I mean, isn't that what, you know, you had Dia Khan on the podcast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's that's yeah. kind of what, what she did as well. She, you know, she, yeah. and then, I mean, the same thing with Daryl Davis, who's the, you know, he's a black jazz musician who has converted yeah. some like 200 members of the KKK. That kind of, you know, compassionate engagement and especially, and so this is one of those things that's really, sometimes people get upset with me for advocating, you know, reaching out to people in these groups. And they'll say things like, you know, well, it's not, it's not safe, right? Like, and the thing is, like, some people don't feel safe doing that. They don't feel safe either, you know, physically or emotionally or however you want to put it. There are many restrictions on people's ability to actually use these tactics. But the thing is, if, if you are willing and able you, and you do feel safe enough to do it, then I think it's extremely powerful to have people from the groups targeted by like white supremacists and, and such and jihadists. Like if, if it's, very, it's very powerful to have the people that they have most demonized being the ones reaching back to them because they are like a physical, a living embodiment of what they believe and have been taught to despise, right? Mm. So for me to have David Abedball, an Orthodox Jew, who I hear all kinds of terrible things about how, what a crafty deceiver and, you know, all these things. And then to have him, you know, joking with me, you know, about Hebrew, whatever, like I, was, I started learning Hebrew so I could better argue against, mm -hmm. you know, Jewish, Jewish theology. And, and it's just, it's impossible not to be at least somewhat moved by that, like to, to have the person that you have most demonized engaging with you in this really kind way. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously been very powerful for all the people who, in these groups who have been moved by people like Daryl Davis and Dia Khan. So what do you think about deplatforming? And what do you think the social media policies should be? What should Twitter be doing with people who are espousing hate on the platform? I mean, I, th I think the circumstances and the context matter a lot. I think you don't have to give like a large public platform, you know, I, and I don't mean, I'm not talking about social media. I'm talking about specifically like, you know, having, you know, a, a member of the KKK give a talk in an auditorium with 1200 people or whatever. Mm. I don't think, I don't consider it deplatforming to not give them that kind of platform. I do think, I mean, and, and would hope that, you know, social media, the power of social media to, to reach people in these, in these groups that have isolated themselves ideologically, if not, if not in other ways, the power to reach them, like you have to actually have a mechanism to reach them. And social media, it seems to me, is, is it's a very limited way of, it's not like having them stand on a stage with, you know, thousands of people there to listen or whatever. It's, there are ways to, to limit their, so I just don't think Unless there is actual, like threats of actual harm, and things that are illegal, like so, mm. those kinds of threats. Yeah, and doxing people. Yes, exactly, yeah. and doxing. Like so, I mean, there there are obviously cases where 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 they should be, you know, when they're doing things that are illegal, this should be taken off the platform. But for those who are just espousing bad ideas, I don't think deplatforming is the answer. I don't. That's not the best answer. It's not. You can't isolate those people further and expect them to just suddenly come to the light. Like there has to be some mechanism for that. And, and it seems to me that social media would be a really great way for that to happen. But that, that can't happen if you just kick them off. Was there any racist or white supremacist component to the Westboro Doctrine? No. And in fact, I don't think we talked about this, but um, my grandfather was a civil rights lawyer. He got an award from the NAACP. I write about this a lot in the book. I mean, so yeah, he, for, for decades. It. Yeah, him and his, yeah, <laughs> he required his children and many of their spouses also to, to go to law school so that they could help him with that work. And for him, that was also a component of his theology. Like there were these verses they would quote about how, you know, God has made of one blood all nations of men to, to dwell on the earth. And so one law shall be to to him that is homeborn and to the stranger that sojourns among you. So that basically equality under the law is something that they absolutely believe in and that they believe is scriptural. And so, yeah, so there was none, none of that. Mm -hmm. They actually have a sign now that says racism is a sin. So 
That's a, ha- a comparatively happy thought compared right. to what, what, what else I got going on. Right. Another question here. Do you have anything like flashbacks or or any kind of lingering trauma from your experience that you would want to talk about? Or mm. feel free to skip it if you don't like it. But. No, it's okay. It was, yes, it's it's definitely gotten better as time has gone on. And it doesn't happen nearly as often now as it used to. But... I mean, especially that that time before I left Westboro in the, you know, leading up to th- that, there was about four months between that moment of epiphany, the what if we're just people moment, and when I actually left. And that, I felt like I was walking around with a, with a death sentence, you know, and it seems like so many things that happened in those four months are just so deeply burned into my memory. Mm. And there are times that that those those feelings just come back so strongly. I, I mean, I have dreams, especially that are so vivid, and you know, I'll wake up crying from it. So, what was the death sentence? You, you... knowing that I was going to lose everything and everyone. So, every but you were time, no, you were no longer yeah. worried about going to hell at that point, or worried. I was, or I, I was angry. actually at that point. I still yeah. was. I, in fact, I was, I was kind of, I was actually really afraid of my own mind. I didn't know mm. what I could trust and what I couldn't. I kind of was boomeranging back and forth between starting to trust my judgment and and then also feeling completely like it was completely suspect like again that it was satan whispering in my ear and then there were like it was it was so vivid in the time after i left you know i i I wrote about driving to deadwood south dakota after i left and on that road just imagining these these horrific car accidents and just you know and I, I won't I don't have to describe all of it in grotesque detail but like it was they were extremely vivid and and you know there were these signs on the side of the road South Dakota has these um, memorials for victims of fatal car crashes and they say why die and that you know immediately put me in mind of this of this verse that my mom would quote about you know you're supposed to it says repent why will ye die right and so the idea, this this feeling that I had, as Westboro would put it, the wrath of God abiding on me, right? So that got better as time went on, and I, I became less and less afraid. Such that you know, when you said there's not an atom in my body that is afraid of that anymore, that absolutely is is true of me now too. But it was definitely a process of getting there. For me, it's mostly the like the triggering feelings or, or flashbacks that I get now are not about fear of God or like worrying that Westboro is actually, actually has it right. It's just the, the memory of, of, you know, cause I, I love my family very deeply and I, I still do. And those, those memories leading up to leaving are just extremely painful. And, and the mm. dreams that I still get now, they don't happen all the time. I would, I would say probably, I don't know, maybe six, six times a year I will wake up you know, just kind of a wreck, but, Mm. but for the most part, it's, it's, I feel really grateful and really lucky to be where I am now. Megan, it's, it's so great to get you back on the podcast. You know, I love your, I love your voice and you're one of the more impressive people I've ever met. It's really, it's, you know, to think of where you came from and who you've become, it's like, yes, we've got genes and and the environment, and yeah, but you, you're one of those cases where one starts looking around for a third ingredient because it's really inexplicable <laughs> how how you've emerged here. Thank you. And you have your your book is coming out. Uh, it will probably be out the moment we release this, and um, you will be beaten down by a book tour with baby in tow. Yeah. What else is going on? What's what? What are you after you recover from your book tour? What do you imagine the next chapter looks like? I definitely want to keep writing. I'm still debating what I want to tackle next. I'm sure it'll be some somewhat related to this. I'm I'm really fascinated by the way people think and how people change. And so I mean I have I have some ideas about things I want to like look at from a more I I don't want it to just keep being about my own experience. I mean, it's been really wonderful and valuable to to interrogate my own experiences, but now seeing more specifically how they can be, how they resonate with other people's experiences and, and ways that we can, we can all benefit from, from them, I think is, 
would be wonderful. I actually get to go on tour with Louis Theroux in January too. Oh, nice. Yeah, Australia and New Zealand. It's a, a speaking tour or what, what's happening? Yeah, he's do, he, he's doing he did a live show in Australia and New Zealand in 2016. So it's another one of those. It, it'll be like going through, I think he'll be revisiting some of his, the subjects that he's tackled in his documentaries. So yeah, I don't know. I'm just, great. I feel like so much of everything has been, you know, devoted to my book and my baby for the last, my baby's going to yeah. be a year on Friday. So it's. Yeah. Well, I, either would be enough, but having yeah. both is a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm just, I'll just wait and see what happens, see where, see where things go. And, and what are the plans for the film based on, on your life story? So Nick Hornby has written a draft of the screenplay, and I think they're, they're, they're still figuring some things out. I, I, I heard somebody say that an entire constellation of stars have to align for a film to get made. So I just like just being, you know, getting to play awards with friends with Nick Hornby has been, mm-hmm. and becoming friends with him has been like, right. if nothing else happens, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy about it. But yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll see. They're 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 working working things out. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, enjoy your book tour. Take care of yourself, and um, I'll see you next time on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sam. If you find this podcast valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can review it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can blog about it or discuss it on your own podcast, or you can support it directly. And you can do this by subscribing through my website at samharris.org. And there you'll find subscriber-only content, like my Ask Me Anything episodes, as well as the bonus questions from many of these interviews. You'll also get advanced tickets to my live events. You'll find all of these things and more at samharris.org. And thank you for supporting the show. Listeners like you